I'm scrolling fast, I'm sorry, it's probably vomitous on the screen. But we started back in, yeah, we had Tyre and Sidon in chapter 28, and then beginning with chapter 29, it'll catch up eventually. Dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun. I'm way ahead of it. Beginning in chapter 29, we had the para- all the oracles of judgment against Egypt. And now you remember why we had judgment against Egypt? We talked about this last week. Why Egypt? Why does Egypt get four chapters of oracles? It's really awful there. Thanks. No. They were the worst? Yeah, they were. To put it in perspective, um, Israel was in captivity in Egypt 400 years, or almost. And it was almost 430 years before they were returned to the promised land. So it is like the epitome of being held captive or slave, which then the Bible uses, New Testament uses, to talk about our enslavement to sin, which we heard from Paul today in Romans. Right? It's like being in Egypt again. Uh, remember, the people, when they were in the wilderness, they kept asking Moses, why can't we just go back? Because at least we had meat pots, which I, I love that. You know, we had, we had uh, beef stew or something. Oh, they didn't eat cows. Mutton stew, whatever, mystery meat stew. And, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, everything was great there. But then what we noticed from Ezekiel earlier in the book, I can't remember which chapter, uh, we noted how Ezekiel pointed out that they brought out the Egyptian gods with them. So they came out of Egypt idolaters as well. Believers, listening to the word of Moses, but with those false gods, right? Which is then why Moses gives, or is given the law on Sinai and delivers it to the people. It is, as Paul says in Galatians, because of trespasses. So it wasn't because they just needed some rules for life. True. It was because sin had been increasing and they, didn't, they were not repenting. They were keep holding on to those Egyptian gods. And what does God do to idolaters and idolatry? What does he do to the idolaters? Yeah, destroys them, cuts them down, burns away, whatever. Right? And what does he do to the idols? Destroys them. Yeah, same thing. All right. And that, that doesn't matter who's the idolater. It could even be his chosen people. Right? Yeah, yeah. Egypt is the epitome of being in the land of slavery, bondage, um, and then being held captive to our own idolatry and to our sin. Okay? Um, so God gives the law to show them how far from the tree they'd fallen. Ha ha. That, that's going to be kind of a pun here in a minute. All right, so we had, we had chapter 29. That was Oracle of Judgment. But remember, 29 was interesting because at the end, it had a little bit of a redemption, Egypt, even for Egypt. Which, of course, is true for the Gentiles, right? The Gentile nations are brought in. So it's kind of interesting the way that Ezekiel puts in one of these, uh, re- bringing back the captives of Egypt to their land. All right, then we have Babylon coming and plundering her. Then we do the same thing again. This time uh, we had Egypt falling, dun, 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 Nebuchadnezzar doing it. That was chapter 29. Then we had, we've talked about this before, but it's worth bringing up again today, that to judge Pharaoh is to judge Egypt. To judge Egypt is to judge Pharaoh. And the, this is still true today. Like, as far as the other nations are concerned, Joe Biden is the epitome of America. Now, you may not like that, but when they think about the status or the quality or the capacity of America, they think of our president. That's who they look to, because he's the figurehead. Right? He represents us, supposedly, uh, for better or for worse, right? So if you, yeah, if you undermine the leader, you undermine the nation. That's the idea. And by the way, there's probably three levels there that you want to think about. You have the leader, you have the nation, and then you have the people. So the nation isn't necessarily the people because like within the people might be slaves and free, citizen, non-citizen. So the nation are citizens, but there may be other people there, right, that aren't part of the... So those are the kind of the three levels. So the... The Pharaoh represents Egypt. Egypt represents Pharaoh, the nation. Not necessarily everybody who dwells in Egypt, which is another whole thing. All right, so we said that. Uh, Let's see. Now we're going to get to 31. So uh, maybe read the first nine verses or so. We'll do that first. Now it came to pass in the 11th year, in the third month, 
on the first day of the month that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, Whom are you like in your greatness? Indeed, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon, with fine branches that shaded the forest, and of high stature. And its top was among the thick boughs. The waters made it grow, underground waters gave it height, with their rivers running around the place where it was planted, and sent out riverlets to all the trees in the field. Therefore, its height was exalted above all the trees of the field, its boughs were multiplied, and its branches became long because of the abundance of water, as it set them up. All the birds of the heavens made their nest in its boughs. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field brought forth their young, and in its shadow, all great nations made their home. Thus it was beautiful in greatness and in the length of its branches, because its roots reached to abundant waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. The fir trees were not like its boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like its branches. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. I made it beautiful with a multitude of branches, so that all trees of Eden and it that were in the garden of God. Whew. Now that's an interesting statement at the end there. We'll have to come to that. Do you think uh, that the uh, horseman uh, heard about Ezekiel and thought, ooh. Yeah, you're, way, you're way ahead of us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> all right. I, I, I Slow down. You, <laughs> you mean uh, y- y- Gardasil or whatever it's called? Yeah, the world tree. The world tree, yeah. All right. Um, so, when are we? Ethan's like verses of verses. You're right. It's a good question. I have notes on about it on here. Lots of notes about it on here. The whole second paragraph is on the topic, but you're. Oh. Get it? We got read that. Yeah, fine. <laughs> That's why I prepare it so you could ignore it. Uh, okay, so it came to pass in the 11th year, third month, on the first day of the month. If you go back to chapter 30. This puts us about two months after chapter 30. So we're in the same context of chapter 30. But these oracles come out against Egypt. Um, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. So there you get both Pharaoh and the nation, right? And then most of this chapter, he's actually going to be talking about Assyria. But it's an oracle of judgment against Pharaoh and Egypt. Um, Why would we do that? Well, remember, we already talked about Egypt being... Not what it once was at this point already. Um, they've already been conquered. Actually, really not been much to look at. Not, not all that significant since David conquered them, uh, defeated them. I remember the name of the battle. You have to look a few sheets back to find that. All right. Um, but Assyria has been much more recent history and has been very significant. Uh, and Assyria actually lasted a lot longer than Babylon will. It's one of the things we miss about Babylon because we hear so much about it in the scriptures is that the to- their total, like, I mean, it's basically a half century. It's not that long. The people are in front, their entire known history, as far as their significance uh, throughout the world, is complete, completely connects to their conquering of, um, of Assyria and then uh, bringing in Israel and then Judah. And then when they return, the exiles is kind of the end of their reign as well. So everything we know, everything we need to know about the, the great empire of Babylon is contained basically within the Israel of Israel and Judah, and, and that thereby in the scriptures. Whereas Assyria, there's a lot more that can be said that's not even recorded. Uh, we've been hearing a little bit about of Assyria 100 years before the end of Assyria in Isaiah and the daily readings, right? With um, What's his name? Sennacherib? Yeah, Sennacherib and his messenger to Hezekiah. All right, so um, Assyria is actually more significant. Um, I probably put some notes here about that. This is like the fall of the king of Tyre. In both cases, pride goes, oh yeah, I want to make sure we remember the proverb. Pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall, if that's one. Boy, that applies to all of these situations, doesn't it? Although now defunct, Assyria had dominated the ancient Near East for centuries, about 400 years as well. Although Babylon bested Egypt at Carchemish in 605 BC, and uh, by the way, defeating Egypt at Carchemish was defeating Assyria because Egypt was in league with Assyria at that point. 
Um, Babylon, the Babylonian Empire lasted a little over a half century, about 70 years. Assyria is, in, at least in the mind of Ezekiel and his hearers, going to be the archetypal, typical imperial power. It's what it means to be empires of Assyria. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Now, Assyrian kings are usually attached to the date palm, which is kind of fun. So that was the sign of their wealth and luxury and um, grandeur. But uh, we, we've heard a lot in the Bible uh, b before this about the uh, kind of the significance of the cedars of Lebanon. They're in the Psalms. It's the cedars of Lebanon that, that formed the, uh, um, the major structure of the temple. They floated them down the Mediterranean and then carried them by land. Right? So these are, they're known for their cedars. I don't know if they are today. Any of you go to Syria, to Lebanon, that neck of the woods? No, you've never been over there? It's probably not a pleasant place to go most of the time. No, it seems like wars and civil wars, right? Uh, the Syrian wars we fund, and the Russians try to keep stopping it, and we keep fighting there. Like, why are we sending people bombs and things to Syria? I don't know. Anyway, that's another story for another day. Um, so the, the tree here is no ordinary tree, as Ethan already pointed out. Um, this is a, a tree that shades the forest. It's so large that it shades the forest. Do you know about world trees? Ethan brought this up with um, Yggdrasil, or however you pronounce it. You, you, thanks. Yeah, you've watched Thor too many times. Well, Terrence Malick's I wanted to watch. One of the people that are the Ewok, or the creatures, I can't think of the name of it. The Ewoks? Not the Ewoks. Ewoks live in the tree. No. You mean? The one where the guy's paralyzed and then you go into the thing and then you, it's like. Oh yeah, what was that? You know, you can become the, the creatures and then the tree is like the big spiritual mm -hmm. being center of their whole. Yeah. I know you know what it is. I can't they, they, if you're really into world tree, the idea of world trees, um, at some point they were felled by the, by the giants. Um, and like Devil's Tower is the stump of a, of a world tree. Yeah, have you seen Devil's Tower? Yeah. It's actually a fossilized stump. Oh. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you've seen it from that. Um, and there, yeah, I don't know who, I mean, you have to be a pretty large person to cut down that tree. <laughs> It's a fight with the gods or something. This is part of common mythology. Why, why a tree? Um, I think it's pretty straightforward, and it's what's going to be used as a device here. The tree reaches up to the heavens. It's planted on the earth, and then its roots reach down into the, the underground, the underworld. So the tree is what connects heaven, earth, and hell, if you like, or Hades, or Sheol, or the pit, or whatever, right? So that's the significance. Now, this is a weird tree because it, it shades the forest. It's so large. Its top is, above, is among the thickest of the boughs. Uh, the waters made it grow. Underground waters give it the height. So there it is. There's rivers running around it. Its height is exalted above all the other trees of the field. Now, this is a metaphor, of course. This is just talking about the significance of Assyria. Everybody else was servant to Assyria. Assyria was the empire, right? This, this is the way of the world. There's always an empire. There's always somebody who's the, you know, the world power as we call them today, right? Yeah, or at least for a region anyway. Um, and then uh, the birds of the heavens make their nests in their boughs. Hey, that sounds familiar. Where have we heard that before? Yeah, in our reading this week with the, uh, was it this week with the mustard seed and it becomes a tree and the birds find their, yeah. So there that, oh, that might be a connection to what Jesus said. Um, and the branches reach out. So you're talking about how much influence Assyria had because they, they were well fed. They could reach out to all over the place. And then under the branches, the beasts of the field brought forth their young. And in its shadow, great nations made their home. So there it's explicit that Assyria becomes this shelter for the other nations. As long as what's necessary to be under Assyria's branches Yeah, they pay taxes. That's right. As long as you pay your taxes and you swear fealty, probably not only to the emperor, but also to, as God, right? Yeah, then they're fine. They'll take care of you. Rome adopts the same thing. We do the same thing. You know, you can be our allies. It just means you have to use the dollar and 
um, submit to putting military bases on your property, our military bases. Yeah. All right. This, uh, thus it was beautiful in greatness. Um, its roots reached to abundant waters. So it's tall and it's wide and it's deep, right? And then it gets a little strange. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this probably bugged you a little bit. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. So they're not even the garden, the trees in the garden compared to this tree of Assyria. Now, there's a lot of ways you can think about this tree. It could be the significance of its authority or power, right? Its influence on the world stage, the number of people that dwell there, right? The commerce and trade. Well, compared to what happened in the garden, in the garden you had two going on, eventually five people, six, seven, eight, it keeps going, but you know, it starts with two and there's just a few trees, right? Yeah. So it is an interesting statement. I think it's, uh, I don't know, Ezekiel is, seems like he's just kind of running with the spirit on this one. Just go where it goes. Because no tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. Um, but I do think we want to remember something. I think we, I don't remember when we talked about this, is that the goal for us is not to return to Eden. What is the Steinbeck novel, East of Eden? Um, the goal is not to return to Eden, but actually God will, because we don't need to go back to the tree of life. Because we have our tree of life, which is Christ crucified, right? So, so we look forward to a new heavens, a new earth, to a, a greater Eden than the original Eden, just as Jesus is the new Adam, a, you know, the sinless one dying for the sinful. So it, it shouldn't bug us that the trees of the garden are overshadowed by these kingdoms and the nations because God will actually gather us in the shadow of his wings, right? So there's that same language of being hidden in the shadow, nurtured from the, we're grafted onto that, the vine, Jesus is the branch, we are the vine, right? He is the vine, we are the branches, there we go. Yeah, so all of this metaphorical language about the significance of this shrubbery, <laughs> well, it's a tree, okay, fine. What, what do you call study of trees? Horticulture, no, it's more specific. Tree people, what do you call tree people? People who are into trees? Um, tree arborist. Arborist. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ethan <laughs> Scott. <laughs> tree arborist. Uh, as significant as I would suggest to you, you want to think here, as significant as Assyria is, and even more significant than the Garden of Eden, still no comparison to the new heavens and the new earth. And there is no cosmic tree mentioned in the apocalypse because Christ is actually. Christ is the river whose streams make... There is the tree of life, which is Christ. He's the tree of life. He's the river flowing. He fulfills all of this. Assyria tried to do it on their own without, without, without Jesus. All right. But anyway, it is beautiful and it is significant. And even the trees of Eden envied it that were in the garden of God. Um, those, are, those trees are going to come back here in a minute. So it's... As odd as that is, they're going to come back. All right, let's talk more about this tree of life thing. Um, I found out about a guy who does comparative religion that I didn't know about. Very significant book back in the 50s. I asked uh, Pastor Riley about it, and of course he's read it. I haven't. Um, of course. Of course. Uh, some, some uh, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. It's some foreign name. Anyway, he came up with this statement of the, uh, the world tree being the Amago Mundi. Now, you've heard of the Amago Dei, that we are made in the image of God. But he says this cosmic tree is like the image of the world. So it's a common theme. Ethan mentioned Eucharist seal, the, the Norse one. Um, the Germans had it. Remember, Boniface cut, cut down their tree, and then he built the temple. So your ancestors, the Germans, worship trees. You still do at Christmas time. Um, you know, I can't, can't get rid of the paganism. It's always around. Now you put some Jesus things on it so that you feel better about it. And then, um, what was I going to say? I got distracted. Who else has world trees? Everybody has these things. All right? It's a common image. And because of that um, connection between heaven and earth, um, sometimes they're deified. They are God. Or... They're the representative of God, or they represent the king or the kingdom. 
and in kind of a deified way. All right. Uh, but of course, we can't do this because we don't worship the creature. We worship the creator, right? We never worship a creature. We only worship the creator. This is, this is the prohibition we heard today in the first commandment. Shall not make any carved image or any likeness of things heaven above or earth beneath and worship them, which is the key there. It's not that you can't have statues. You just can't say they're representatives of God and worship them. Images, paintings, all of that kind of thing. All right. Because they're creations, not creator. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, Because they were semi-divine, these trees are often associated with kings. Oh, I said that. Ezekiel used this metaphor in chapter, oh, I didn't say, chapter 17. It got cut off for some reason. So back in chapter 17, he kind of danced around this idea. We talked about it a little bit then. Uh, Daniel 4 is a notable example with Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that one? So he, or the kingdom of Babylon, is likened to being one of these big, oh, I was going to say big-ass trees, but I thought I shouldn't say that. (laughs) Well, you did. What? Did that come out loud? (laughs) All right. Here, I'll show you. Uh, Where are we here? These are the visions of my head while I was on my bed. I always like how that rhymes. I was looking, behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached the heavens. This sounds familiar. And it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field were found under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh were fed from it. So he's telling the vision to Daniel. Daniel's going to interpret it. So Nebuchadnezzar has the same dream, a similar dream that Ezekiel, also in exile in Babylon, uses to describe what's happening to Egypt by way of Assyria. But they're contemporaries, and they're both in Babylon. Maybe it's like an ancient Sumerian thing, or it's, a, it's at least Mesopotamian, right? So there it is. Oh, and then what happens to that tree? It gets cut down, down to the stump. All right, yeah. So we're just talking about Babylon there, but here we're going to talk about Assyria. And then we talked about the mustard seed, didn't we? Um, there's, that third paragraph has to do with the whole bit about it being envy of the trees of the garden. Uh, by the way, the only tree, the, there's the tree of life, is Christ. Revelation 2. Jesus is the Messiah described as a branch. I gave you all the scriptures for that. His cross is described as the tree, right? It brings healing to the nations. All right, so, so despite Assyria's, Assyria's attempts to be both Christ and his cross, um, it falls short. All right, so now we have to destroy the tree. Aw, don't cut down the tree. Who wants to read next? 10 to 14. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it towered high and set its top among the clouds and its heart was proud of its height, I will give it into the hand of the mighty one of the nations. He shall surely deal with it as its wickedness deserves. I have cast it out. Foreigners, the most ruthless of nations, have cut it down and left it. On the mountains and in all the valleys, its branches have fallen, and its boughs have been broken in all the ravines of the land. And all the peoples of the earth have gone away from the shadow and have left it. Mm. On its fallen trunk dwell all the birds of the heavens, and on its branches are all the beasts of the field. All this is in order that no tree by the water may grow to towering height or set their tops among the clouds, and that no trees that drink water may reach up to their height. For they all are given over to death. Okay. Come here, Dorothy. No. Ah. All right. Wow, you're getting heavy too. All right. So this is again the destruction of Assyria, but it's also the destruction of Egypt, right? So this is a metaphorical or a parable to destroy what's or to describe what's happening happened to Assyria already but also then portending or pre whatever you want to say, prophesying of the destruction that will come to Egypt in the same way. Which, uh, I mentioned to you Ray Dalio a couple weeks ago. I don't know if any of you went and found it. I should have given you the link where he does the whole, the kind of, he gives four empires where he goes through this, the cycle of empires. He does it economically, but it doesn't really matter. 
We see this in the scriptures too. What happened to Assyria will happen to Egypt and it will happen to Babylon. It will happen to, it happened to the French, it happened to the Dutch, it happens to the English, it happens to the United States, it will happen to China until the Lord comes again. <laughs> right? I mean, you could call it the cycle of nations, if you like. It happened even within Israel during the time of the judges. Right? God raised them up. They lived and then lived as if God did not matter and they went into sin and God brought a judge and they were brought into great bondage and then God delivered them when they cried out for help and he restored them and then they f- believed for a time and then fell back into unbelief and uh, you know the cycle. You've seen this before. All right. It's, it's almost as if our lives are cyclical that way. Daily dying and rising with Christ. Hmm. Uh, nations too then. All right. What did we, what did we miss out here? All right, so why, what, why are they cut down? Why was Assyria cut down by Babylon, ultimately? Because of pride, right? It's that its heart was lifted up in its height. It thought too much of itself. Pride goes before the fall. The dollar will never lose its dominance in the world. Right? The U.S. military can't be defeated. We have bigger planes or bigger boats and faster planes. Whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, we ran, and, and, and oil reserves too. We really can't go to war because we don't have the oil reserves to do it. You have to have all that oil in reserve. That's why you keep that stockpile. But, oh well, can't go to war, which not, I'm not really too upset about that. No, we don't need to do that. But uh, regardless, yeah, what, it's, all, it's just pride. It's just hubris, right? He, um, who... The Sultanitsyn quote, I don't know if it's Sultanitsyn, whoever it is, right? With the weak man and the strong man and, you know, the four, four parts? Weak men make weak nations. How does it go? Hard times produce strong men. Strong men. And easy times produce weak men. Yeah, there's four parts. You'll find it. All right. So, again, that's another way of saying the same thing that Ezekiel's doing here. This is just like what happened yeah, yeah, that's the first story of the city that's built by Tubal Cain and you know the the whatever he is, great great grandson of Cain, builds the great city and they think that God doesn't matter and they matter most and they're gonna they're gonna be gods and then what does God say? Yeah, good luck with that. God's gonna cut you down to quote uh, the poet. All right, so uh, that's what happened to Assyria and even the birds and everything just kind of on the rubble, right? They just kind of live on the rubble, live off the rubble. Is, has Assyria been raised up again? Assyria or Assyria become a great nation ever again? No. No. Uh, so then out of its ruins, there are the birds and there are the beasts. And then you have this kind of like poetic statement at the end. So that no trees by the waters may ever exalt themselves for its height nor set their tops among the thick boughs, no trink. So it's like, like I said, it's never coming back again. Same thing with Egypt, same thing with Babylon, same thing with the, the Reich and the Vaterland, <laughs> right? It was cut down, for better or for worse. Because here it is. Oh, I'll scroll up so you can all see it. We want to talk about this a little bit. For they have all been delivered to death, all of them, all the trees, the big tree, Assyria and all the subsequent trees that submitted to Assyria to the depths of the earth among the children of men who go down to the pit. All right. So now we get to do all this is connected back to 28 where we had uh, Tyre going down like the devil being uh, cast out of heaven. Right. But now we have these nations going down into the earth, into the underworld, to the pit Also known elsewhere in Ezekiel, in the next chapter actually, or two chapters from now, 33, yeah. Um, Sheol, you've heard of Sheol? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't, we don't talk a lot about all these different words. Hades, by the way, is Greek, so that's in the New Testament. And sometimes the Old Testament, Greek version, translates these as as Hades. Uh, Because that's obviously a Greek myth, right? Yeah. Um, Sheol is the, it can be used two different ways. It can be the place prepared for the devil and their angels, which we usually say hell or Hades. It can also just mean the place of the dead until the resurrection, which we don't really have a word for that. Right? Maybe we just say the grave. 
right? So now they rest in the grave until the day of resurrection. So when you die in the Lord, you don't, well, actually, when you die, it doesn't matter whether you're in the Lord or not. You, you, it's not like, do not pass, go, go, go directly to hell if you're an unbeliever, right? Just as the same, do not pass, go directly to heaven if you're a believer. No, you wait in the grave until the day of resurrection. That's one perspective anyway. As far as the dead are concerned, it's already the day of resurrection because there's no time once you're dead. You're already in eternity. Your heart's not ticking. There's no way to keep track of time, right? Um, <laughs> good, good, good timing. Yeah. Uh, so this is that, this is like, I don't know, like an in-between place maybe? It could be. I think here the pit though is hell or Hades. That's what we're talking about. Because these nations are being condemned eternally. Make sense so far? All right. Yeah, but sometimes Sheol or the pit um, is kind of uh, the place of the dead. But note too, we have the psalmist and then fulfilled in Jesus. Psalm 22 probably, isn't it? That you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Is that Psalm 22? Mm -hmm. You will not abandon, yeah. Say to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. What am I quoting? I don't know. I didn't put it down. It's some psalm. You'll find it. All right, if you want. So here, um, this is the only place in Ezekiel this phrase is used, children of men, which is a great movie, by the way, children of men. Um, if you're into future apocalypse stuff. Uh, so all of them are going down into the pit. And then we're going to have a conversation in the pit. That sounds like fun. All right, so verse 15. And following. Who wants to read? Thus says the Lord God, in the day when it went down to hell, I caused mourning. I covered the deep because of it. I restrained its rivers, and the great waters were held back. I caused Lebanon to mourn for it, and all the trees of the field wilted because of it. Mm. I made the nations shake at the sounds of its at the sound of its fall. When I cast it down to hell, together with those who descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water, were comforted in the depths of the earth. They also went down to hell with it, with those slain by the sword. And those who were its strong arm dwelt in its shadows among the nations. All right, I'm going to scroll a little bit. There you go. To which the trees of Eden will you then be likened in glory and greatness. Yet you shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the depths of the earth. You shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all it, his multitude, says the Lord God. <laughs> There's that weird statement again. We had this with Tyre. And we talked about, we know that they circumcised in Tyre. Not because they had God's command, but probably just mimicry. They're just mimicking the instruction given to the Hebrews. Well, first to Abraham, right? To be circumcised. Because that's not something you're going to come up with on your own. Like, oh, this seems like a good idea. A little bit of extra skin. Let's just cut it off. Uh, no. Right? But it is mentioned here. I don't think the Egyptians circumcised. They did. Did they? Okay. So, there you go. So that's also an accusation that you're going to go have to live with the uncircumcised. Uh, lots of mimicry going on there. Then, All right. Um, so, yeah, this is weird because we have creation. Oh, sorry. We have creation mourning, right? The, the waters are restrained. The trees wilt because of the conquering of this great and mighty Assyrian cedar, Lebanon cedar, right? The nations are shaking, right? All the trees of Eden were comforted in the depths of the earth. What is that all about? How, how are the trees that are already in the pit going to be comforted by the great tree coming down with it? And it's schadenfreude or misery loves company, right? Say, like, if, ah. Especially if we're viewing Sheol as like, the place of like, death, like they're dead. Uh, dead. But this is condemned. This is dead and condemned. Yeah, they are. I told you, you can't go back to Eden. 
You don't want to go back to Eden because Adam forfeited Eden to Satan. Right? Okay. God cast him out. Like, this is not a good place for you anymore. Huh. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? It's a little speculative, but eh, you can run with it. All right. Anyway, no, it's, it's, the, it's misery loves company. Oh, at least Assyria is here with us in this terrible place of torment. This is, this is why um, the, the poor Lazarus, or not Lazarus. Yeah, Lazarus, he gets it all wrong. He's like, he wants his brothers to come to hell with him because then they can all at least have a terrible time together. He won't be alone in his misery. Send Lazarus so that the rich man can have his brothers with him. No, no. So, so Assyria, this is the trees of Eden, uh, they, they commiserate. They yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, it's true. The trees here are, are desperate for water, just like the rich man in, in Hades. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so the motif of the journey to Sheol of the tree representing Assyria and the fate of, Eze- of Ezekiel, no, of Egypt, is given again. Sorry, there's a typo there. Previously introduced regarding Tyre going to hell with its fullest treatment coming in the next chapter. We'll have Pharaoh going to hell in, in the next chapter. The language regarding Assyria and Pharaoh is that of Judgment Day. You can hear all that language, right? We already mentioned some of that. The wilting. There's no fire mentioned, but the water is dried up. So we have that, right? And we have mourning, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Oh, that doesn't say that, but you hear that language. And then I suggest to you that every divine judgment in history can and must be understood as a miniature or a type of the final judgment of all people at the end of the world upon the return of Jesus Christ. So you have all the little judgments which are teaching you something of the greater judgment. This is why Jesus can say, when you see these things happening, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and people fainting for fear and foreboding of what's coming on the world, what can you do? Lift up for your redemption's drawing near. Those are signs of the judgment. If the judgment's coming, you already know the verdict for you have been forgiven in Jesus, right? So we have, the, we have the kind of negative side of judgment here, which is helpful to uh, present. But there's also the positive side. Christians view judgment uh, via the cross, where Christ suffered the entirety of divine judgment for humanity's sin. All in Christ receive the free gift of his righteousness. Uh, I heard that today. And so will be acquitted on the last day. Or I would even suggest you're already acquitted. You'll just hear it uh, pronounced publicly. Well, you're here pronounced publicly in church. I forgive you all your sins in the name of... Okay. All right. So there you go. The cross is the hermeneutical key. Actually, uh, Chad Bird, my friend, has a book called The Christ Key. The Christ Key. The key to unlocking the scriptures. That's what that means. Uh, For reading all of the judgment oracles in Old Testament. Those like Pharaoh or Assyria who do not believe in the Son remain under God's wrath and the last day will be condemned to hell for all eternity. And then, to the point that I was trying to make to you a minute ago, the final judgment is often pictured as a dissolution of the present order of creation to enable a new creation. And I don't think we believe this, but I forgot about it. I didn't really believe it. And then when when we read um, uh, Mr. uh, What's his name? Gerard. uh, Two weeks ago, or three weeks ago. Not this episode from Friday, but the one from a couple weeks ago where he makes the same point in, uh, in that book that I saw of Satan fall like lightning, is that the new creation will come out of the disorder. So we had chaos, tohu v'bohu in, in uh, Hebrew. Tohu v'bohu, you know what that is? That's when God hovered over the face of the deep, right? And he brought order out of chaos, right? It was a primordial chaos, and then he brought... Each day, everything's put in order, right? Sand, land and water, earth and sky, or earth and sky, animals, different kinds of animals, man, etc. right? But then what's happening in creation since the introduction of sin? It's returning to the chaos, right? Disorder, right? But God's actually working through that because then he's going to make all things new again from the ultimate chaos, which will be that's all the fear and foreboding stuff, right? Earthquakes, tsunamis from Alaska. There was an earthquake in Alaska yesterday, last night. You know about this? Yeah, 7.4 or something, Aleutians. So it'll, there'll be a tsunami all on, through the Pacific here. There's tsunami warnings. 
Right, these kind of things, you know, the stuff that the climatologists tell you you're supposed to be afraid of, climate change is going to kill you all. They're not wrong. I mean, God does say it's going to be fire and earthquakes and, yeah. And that, but, the, but what they're wrong about is that it's our fault. Well, no, they're not wrong about that either. <laughs> it's, because, it's because of human action. Oh, well, they're not wrong about that either. But there's no divine judgment that's calling you to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah, but you can't appease her. Well, can, they're making it like we can control it. It's not yeah, through sacrificial death. Right. Right. You need to die in order to appease the God. Exactly. There's too many people. And that's why she's angry with us. Because we're taking all her stuff or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, just stay in your house. So if, if you want to see this, really the, the, the mo- where this comes from is the preaching of Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah 4. I'm going to have to skip a whole bunch here for the sake of time. (laughs) What? It's it's what you have to do. You can't cover everything. Oh, my my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart, I love Jeremiah. Oh, so, so intense. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried. Oh, there you go. For the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of trumpet? For my people are foolish. This is the Lord speaking. They have not known me. They are silly children. (laughs) (laughs) And they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but do good. To do good, they have no knowledge. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. They are silly children. What is Foolish. Okay, well, either way. And then listen to this. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. This is after the judgment. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth. Earthquakes, right? The earth is split. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, and yet I will not make a a full end. We heard this in the sermon, right? The law is not God's final word. But this is what it does. It makes desolate. Uh For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens will be black, above will be black, because I have spoken. I have purposed and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into the thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken. We could even say every empire. And not a man shall dwell in it. What will you do? But then here's the language. Um, We hear this in the New Testament. Yeah, from Paul. All creation grows with birth pangs until now. Right? For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spread her hands saying, woe is me now for my soul is weary because of my murderers. And then of course, there's justice. And eventually the earth is restored, but we're not going to go that far. (laughs) Uh, New Testament language has the same sort of thing about God remaking new heavens and new earth out out of the chaos that he actually renders. Um, We don't even have to go to Revelation for this. Uh, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holiness and godliness, holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening of, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Huh, we're supposed to hasten it on? Weird. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved. So you have this whole being brought into chaos again. But then, of course, according, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Hey, We're, things, does that mean like praying for it to come? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? I mean, because, I mean, we desire to be with him. So. Spoidontus. From spoido to hurry. Wow, that's an interesting word. Right. Yeah, come quickly. Yeah, come. <laughs> come quickly. But I think we don't always know what we're praying for. I know. We're like, oh, that means the destruction of everything we love. <laughs> but to be with him. But to be with him. Yeah, exactly. That can mean eager to do a thing, 
or to be anxious for or to urge for, to press on, to move towards, that like that, to go on towards. So we hasten towards the day of the, the coming of the day of God. Hasten towards the judgment hall. The bridegroom cries, cries awake. Your lamps with gladness take. Hallelujah, right? I mean, we follow the bridegroom to the wedding hall. Yep, there you go. That's the hymn. Wake awake, right? For night is flying. Yeah, we hasten all to the wedding hall. So that's that language. So there it is in Second uh, Peter. Uh, and then we've talked about creation. I think we've talked about creation talking before and proclaiming. Yeah, so we have the trees here in a negative sense are commiserating or comforting one another along with the tree of Assyria and ultimately Egypt. Um, in the Psalms, Psalm 96, 98, you've got the trees clapping their hands and rejoicing at salvation. So it works both ways. We, we, so while we don't confuse the creature with the creator, I talked about that, right? The tree is not God or the nation, if you like. On the other hand, we don't bifurcate them and say that they don't interact and that they don't. So, so a nation can confess faith in God. Right? I mean, we've even had Lutheran nations for a time. We have nations today that say they're Lutheran, but really aren't. But that, you know, there have been godly kings and princes. And, you know, so that's possible. But even creation is a reflection of us because we're part of creation. Which is an interesting thought. I don't know the implications. I just said it. But I now I have to think about it. What does that mean that creation reflects us? Well, Are we reflect creation? We compare um, Homestead and farms to yeah. polluting cities. Oh, yes. We talked about this this morning with the adults. Good good example. Because um, I was listening to a podcast, and the host was talking to these homesteaders, farmsteaders. Um, he inherited the land. It had been a family farm, but they had leased it out for generations. Um, but he had been an alcoholic, and he was in recovery, and he realized he just needed to do something with his hands that mattered. That was part of the reason he was drinking. It was like despair. Um, so he started, the, he started this uh, farmstead, and then um, the woman who became his wife had moved, this is in southern Illinois, moved there after having been some high-class executive um, because her father was dying. And then, but when she moved, she saw the land again where she came from and, like, and the life of people that don't live in, in the office cubicle. Or, she was talking about it, that they had meetings for, to decide what to do at the next meeting. You know, that kind of life. We can sympathize with this, right? Let's have a meeting to discuss what we're going to do at our meetings. <laughs> but um, um, so then she had gotten into like natural remedy, like healing through food and this kind of thing. Uh, and then they, they met and then they, uh, they had this farm. But the point of the story was, is that then the, about two thirds of the way through this interview with them, um, the host, who's a liberal guy, said, um, so how does this affect it, like your relationship as male and female or man and woman? And she said something very interesting, I thought. She's like, well, he, he does the things that he can only do because he's stronger than I am. And then there are the things that I'm able to do that he can't do or he doesn't want to do. Like, I like to cook, and so I cook. And it, it's funny because he noted that she had been like a feminist, basically, right? I mean, she, had, she lived as if she didn't need a man and she was going to be this high-powered executive and everything. And then once they got back on the land and they had a common purpose of like, we're going to um, provide food for our community because it's not just for them, but it's, they want to provide at least half the food for their community, which is a pretty Southern Illinois winters are still winter, right? I mean, I don't, I guess canning and whatnot. So that's their goal. Um, so living for others, but then also li you know, living support one another in a common endeavor, then oriented their lives in the way that God actually gave them. Right? But when they tried to force in themselves into things that, you know, and she had other things to say, but I'll leave, the, leave that aside as far as these gender roles. But yeah, the gender roles only get confused because we force ourselves out of them, put ourselves in positions where they don't make sense. Um, the Bible's pretty much all of God's, God's people through almost all of the Bible um, are agrarian, nomadic, with flocks and herds. And when they go into cities, it always goes bad. I don't think we should abandon the city, but the city is, the only city that ever gets ordered rightly is the eternal city, the city of God, the heavenly Zion. Every other city doesn't make it. 
And there's something about that, right? Where it's like, because you're disconnected from reality. You're not, you can't, you're not even subsistence farming. You don't even have a garden. You don't, like we don't. We're dependent on others for our food. And maybe there's a place for that. that not everybody can do everything, right? Please don't do that. Um, but being dependent upon others, not in an abstract way, but like I know where we get our milk. I know who, whose chickens give us our eggs, right? I mean, there's only one degree of separation, and I know that person. There's no brokers. And... Both of us. Right. Right. Right, so that's the other aspect. Like environmentalism without farming doesn't make sense to me. It's like if you're not going to teach people how to grow their own food, they're never going to care for the environment. They're just not. They don't care. Mm -hmm. But like uh, RFK Jr., who's running for president, like what, why did he get into um, water safety? That was where he started. With his big court cases was, you know, in uh, the northeast, probably New York, I think. It was the, wa the waterways were contaminated and he couldn't fish in them. And he, he, like, he was a trout fisher, I think, is what he did. So then he sued and, you know, won. Um, now, that's the right kind of environmentalism, right? It's like, this is supposed to provide for me, and because of what you're doing to it, it's not providing me, it's not behaving the way that God intended for it to behave. Whether he would say it that way or not, I think he's Roman Catholic, so probably, right? But, or was. All right, so... Uh, by the way, all creation singing. We actually sing this in the hymn, Joy to the World. <gasps> really? Remember how stanza three goes? Heaven and earth proclaim, heaven and earth proclaim. Yeah. But how's it go? I need a hymnal. Um, <laughs> no more let's sin and sorrows grow. How's it go? Nor thorns infest the ground. Keep going. Rocks sway. All fields and hills. Wait, oh. <laughs> wait, wait. Yeah, he makes his blessings flow far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. Oh, right. was yeah. Oh, it was right. No more let sin and sorrow grow, no thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blood. How's it say it in LSB? It's a little different. Oh, no, it's the second one. Yeah. It's the second stanza. I said stanza three. Listen to stanza two. Let all their... Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. There it is. It stands at three in LSB. It stands at two in this one. Right? But also the removal of the thorns and thistles, too. All right? That's straight out of Isaiah. That is important. All right? Everything is under Yahweh's control. The cedar, Assyria, Egypt, the reaction of the nations, even Sheol, which we often forget. God, God, Jesus says that, the, that, that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, which means who made it? Yeah. So who's the Lord of heaven and hell? Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, he frequents it, but he doesn't, but it, he doesn't frequent it, but it's a pla not a place beyond his reach. See Revelation 1. Sheol can be the grace of the grave, I don't know why I said grace, grave of all people, or the realm of the damned, we talked about that, but as God in Christ has redeemed his people from that fate, so scripture can speak of God delivering believers from Sheol, see Jonah, and even as he did Christ himself. Psalm 16. There it is. I just didn't get far enough on my sheet. Yeah, and then it's quoted by uh, Peter in Acts 2. All the trees of Eden are other powerful and noble princes, is what I'm going to suggest to you is actually going on there. Or the empires they ruled that had preceded Assyria and Egypt. Right? So Mesopotamia, you could say Eden is Mesopotamia. You could do it that way. All of these find a macabre consolation in that, in that the cedar tree, formerly incomparable in its power and beauty, has joined them, to quote Chesterton, in the democracy of the dead. Anybody read Orthodoxy by Chesterton? It's the story of his conversion. And he, I mean, he is a wordsmith. Uh, that's uh, book four of Orthodoxy. You can read it for free. It's like 19, published 1909. There's like 18 editions, though. So He calls it the democracy of the dead. The, the chapter ends with the same rhetorical question that it began with. Right here. Uh, to which of the trees of Eden will you then be likened in glory and greatness? And the answer, whether it's Assyria or Pharaoh, well, yes, it was great in terms of the worldly um, glory, right? But in the end, 
dwells in the same place, right? Has this, suffers the same fate. And uh, we're going to see a lot more about that when Pharaoh goes down to Sheol himself. So here it's likened, Assyria is already there, the great cedar of Lebanon. And Pharaoh, that's going to happen to you. Next chapter, you hear it actually happened to Pharaoh. So, yeah, go look for world trees. Uh, don't. Oh, it is Avatar, yeah. I was going to say, is it the one with the blue people? But I didn't say with the blue. That's right. It was also in um, his Dark Materials, which is anti-Christian as well. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So think of tree myths. Are there other myths of great trees? Probably. Now you'll notice it. And so here Ezekiel just takes that, that mythical idea, which precedes him and then continues to be believed. Um, moving forward, but he, he brings that captive to Christ to teach of the judgment of the nations, right? As great, great and powerful and significant and far-reaching as these nations are, they all meet the same fate because of their rebellion against God. Ultimately, for them, their idolatry is themselves, right? Pride, ego, whatever you might want to call it. So that's going to happen to Pharaoh next time. Right? And then we'll be finally through the parables of judgment, oracles of judgment. And we're going to finally get to all the gospel goodness. We had some gospel here, right? Don't be like Assyria. Worship, worship Christ, right? Look to his tree, the end. The end. 